All right. So I have it. I have it working. Um, there was a question on um, on issue tracker about the fact that if we have those three axes, if we have um, z, x, and y, and we're throwing the phone up, why are we considering the x and y at all? Why we just don't consider the z axis, right? And that's a valid question, but uh, the problem is, um, yeah, can I use your phone? Um, if we have the phone perfectly aligned and we're just doing that, then we will kind of, you know, act on the z-axis only. But what happens if I hold phone like this? What happens if I hold my phone like this? Now the z-axis is, you know, upside down or sideways, right? So if I'm actually holding y-axis up and throwing phone like this, it will be the y-axis which will have the g-force, right? Uh, the, 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 um, the acceleration. So this is kind of rotated the way I'm rotating the phone. So if I'm holding the phone in the hand, I cannot tell where the z is pointing, right? So it can be uh, turned around. So what we know is that the ground is down. Right, so when I'm holding the phone, I know the ground is down, right? And then I can rotate the phone with those Z axis and X and Y axis pointing different directions. And up is there, right? So the, the G force, which is, um, no, the gravity, the G force is, uh, you know, by my hand, but the gravity is, is, the gravity vector will point downwards, right? So depending on the orientation of the phone, I can detect of where the gravity is because I can track of where the gravity vector is based on the on the axis that I'm holding, right? So just like if if I'm holding the phone perfectly like this, the gravity will be the opposite of the z, right? Which is which is fine. So then I will see that on the on the x I have zero, here I have zero, and on the z I will have like negative value, uh, right? So that's fine, but if I turn the phone around, then I will have positive on the Z. If I turn the phone sideways, I will have, um, I will, let's say I will have a positive uh, 9.8 on the X. If I turn it this way, I will have negative on X, right? So I can keep track. So if I'm not doing very rapid movements, I can keep track of what is the orientation of the phone and where the gravity vector is, so I can know the x, y, z components of my vector, kind of the gravity vector, right? And this would be because, like, the gravity doesn't change. The gravity is always the same. So this will be like a low-pass filter, right? So if I have a low-pass filter, which filters out the component, which is the gravity, because when I'm moving my hand, this is like um, the change here is quick, right? So the changes I'm doing with the phone are fast, but the gravity doesn't change. The gravity is always the same. So the component which is not changing will be my, my gravity, and the components that are, that are changing are my mo movements, right? So if I'm filtering out all the rapid movements, what will be left is the, the gravity. So if I run a low-pass filter, and I kind of calculate of where the gravity is pointing, then I could use this vector to, to, to see where the upwards is, right? So then when I throw the ball, I could properly calculate whether I'm actually throwing the ball per perfectly up or not, right? So if you, have, if you have the ground, and you know the gravity is telling me where the ground is, yeah, I, I would need a 3D. Uh, yeah, but let, imagine that it's like simplified. Uh, and then I'm throwing the ball up. If we don't know exactly what the, let's say we, we simplify the problem because it's easier for me to draw it on 2D. <laughs> so let's simplify that it's only X and Y, okay? So now what happens is I'm taking X and Y in my calculations of this G-force and, you, and the, the problem is that when I'm throwing a ball, if I take the magnitude, 
right? So if I'm throwing the ball and I take the magnitude from x and y, I have the x component, which is sideways, sideways movement, right? So I might be throwing the ball this way, which has the x component, and my y component is only that big. But I'm taking the entire magnitude. So this is the magnitude I'm taking by this x square plus y square uh, square square root calculations. I'm calculating this, and I'm assuming this is actually throwing the ball up. But in fact, I might be throwing the ball a little bit sideways, right? So if I have the lab 3 using the formula, I will be using that and assuming that the ball is perfectly thrown upwards. But in fact, it might not be, right? Because in fact, I might be throwing the ball kind of at the angle, right? So now we have this dilemma that if I have my ball and I throw it at the angle, you know, the ball will kind of go like this, right? Uh, but if I throw the ball perfectly up, the ball will go like this, right? So if I have this magnitude, so again, I have kind of the x component and the y component. So this is my y component, my x component. I'm taking both into account. I'm calculating this magnitude. So this is my magnitude which I'm throwing. And if this magnitude was used to throw the ball perfectly upwards, the ball will reach a certain height point. But if this magnitude was actually calculated based on the x and y component, I would not reach because that's the magnitude, right? So this and this is the same, but here I'm throwing the ball, you know, at the angle, and here I'm, I'm throwing the ball at the perfect angle, right? So if you were to make this uh, proper, like if you, for, for example, wanted to make a game that you have to throw the ball up, and then you're kind of waiting to catch it, uh, and you have to throw it kind of perfectly up, then if you throw it like there, you would not catch it because it would fall somewhere else, right? Um, so you would have to calculate those two components properly by knowing where the gravity vector was and how the throw actually happened. Uh, but it's kind of complex. So I answered that you could do that, and that would make the game more, um, more physics-based because you can throw ball upwards or you can throw the ball distance-wise, right? So you could then have a score of how high the ball went and how far, right? So you could kind of have a game with two variables. One is the height the ball reached, the highest point the ball reached here, and one is you know how far you, you throw it. So if I'm throwing like this, I can tell the user, oh yeah, you throw the ball, you know, 50 meters. And if you throw like this, it's like, no, you only throw like one meter, but the height was higher, right? You would have two, two things. But we simplified in lab three, we say, no, it's too complex. Like calculating exactly what is the X and Y component. In fact, it's more complex because you have three axes, right? And three dimensional space. Here we simplify it just, just that you're operating on a plane. Um, so even for the plane, it's kind of complex because you need to track of where exactly is um, where, like you have, let's say you have the two dimensional thing and based on the rotation of the phone, your um, reference point, your reference vector changes. And you need to kind of keep calculating it using the, the low pass uh, filter for the gravity, right? Uh, so you will have to have a sliding window for your throw, and you have to have a sliding window for calculating exactly what is the orientation of the phone, right? Um, so it makes the problem harder, uh, not impossible, but much harder to do. So we, we we said, I, I said, don't bother, like, uh, just use the formula, assume, and what the formula does is, in this case, as I was showing, it basically calculates this and assumes that you're throwing upwards, right? Um, so if you, you know, in the, in the worst case scenario, if, for example, if you say, um, my actually upwards component is really low, my uh, side weight component is really big, it will still calculate this, this uh, amplitude, this kind of magnitude of the movement. So if I, if I do this, it says, oh yeah, you throw 100 meters high, right? Which is a lie, because I, I throw sideways, right? But it assumes, it takes this value and assumes I'm throwing upwards, right? Um, so it's okay, like, 
it's not physically good representation. Like if I do this, I can cheat the game, right? Uh, but the the vector calculated of how how what was the force is correct. It's just that it assumes I'm throwing upwards, right? Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's a quick explanation so on, on the um, on the lab three. Uh, and what we're doing today is we're discussing native development. Whoops. Um, so uh, first, um, how can we develop mobile applications? What do you know? What what are the mechanisms that allow you to develop an application for a mobile phone? Android Studio. Android Studio. Great. So we have one. Uh, <laughs> So we have Android Studio, and what do you use? What is the technology stack that you use? Java. Java. Yeah, you're using Java. What else can you use? An Android Studio. Okay. Can you use Kotlin? Great. What else can you use? So let me just. Oh yeah, I have a full screen mode. So if I go and bring Android Studio, and I will say file new project, it allows me to, yeah, let's say I, I say, well, at, at the bottom it says native C++, right? <laughs> Keep that in mind. So if I say empty activity and I say next, it's, it allows me to pick Java and Kotlin. Um, yeah, let's go back. Um, what else it does? So what if I click native? It yeah. So let's cancel that and let's do file new. Right. So if I click new project, it only allows me to pick Java Kotlin and C++. But if I click, um, do you see it at all? There is uh, one which says, uh, ah, where is the mouse? New Flutter project. You see this? No. So you have new project or new Flutter project. So if I click new Flutter project, it allows me to use Flutter. You know what Flutter is? So Flutter is another. Um, possibility of developing applications for an Android Studio for mobile. Um, in particular, so yeah, so let's go back here. So Flutter. And Flutter is using programming language called Dart. And Dart is another programming language which uh, was developed in at Google. Uh, it's um, more dynamic in nature than like Go, for example, uh, and it is developed for mobile applications, for cross-platform mobile applications. We will have a lecture next week about Flutter and Dart, right? So if we're using Android Studio, I can use those kind of four things. What else can I use? So here we also saw that I can use C++, right? Um, it is not entirely true that I will be developing the entire app in C++ using Android Studio, but it is possible to do both. It's possible to use uh, C++ as a library or as a kind of an entire app uh, language. What else can I use? SQL. SQL? Yeah, just direct data. Yeah, but that's more for data access. It's yeah. not for like a UI yeah, or yeah. yeah for developing the logic of the application, right? So if you have, let's say, you have some logic, you want um, 
I don't know, you have a simple app to calculate tax, right? How much tax someone should pay. So they enter some things and then there is a tax calculation. What can you do for them to be able to use it on the mobile? So you can develop an app using Android Studio. Uh, what else can you do? Could you write a simple web app, which then they open on their mobile phone and use that app on the phone? You could, right? So they could use a browser uh, and run an app in the browser, right? So kind of, let's say, browser-based uh, app that is loaded from the, from the website. Um, when we were discussing early in the semester, when we were discussing the uh, origins of the mobile platforms, I said that uh, Apple, when they first introduced I iPhone, they didn't thought about anything else but browser-based apps. That was the main purpose, right? Uh, and some early platforms like Nokia and so on, they also were just using browser as a way for getting some logic and some games and some things done. Um, so this this is kind of a, we can call it browser based, but it what it kind of really is is um, you have you know HTML, um, CSS, and JavaScript stack that you can use in a browser, but you can also package it up and load it as a standalone application, right? So you can take all this HTML, CSS, and JavaScript logic put it together, put it onto the phone, and the phone will display it using a web view or, or a browser, but you don't really need to load it from the server. You can already have it on the, on the phone, right? So there is a, typically we refer to it as a Cordova, right? So there is a technology uh, which allows you to package it up and load it as a single, like, standalone application, right? So Cordova is a kind of a set of tools and libraries to allow you to do that. So you can do those things, right? Um, so those, I hope you, you knew before the lecture, right? Um, so um, this is the list that kind of covers most of the things, right? So you mentioned Kotlin Java, Flutter and Dart. We will cover it in the next, next week lecture. Um, there is a technology stack called Xamarin. And Xamarin, I will talk a little bit in a minute. Um, we have C++, so we already saw it. You can kind of do cross-platform development using C++ uh, directly in Android Studio. You can use Go, um, develop a, an app mobile application in Go, and dot, 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 in other languages, like you know Rust, Haskell, Clojure. There is potentially any programming language you know can be used to develop an app on the mobile phone with more or less Portable, right? It's easier or harder some for, for some of the languages. Um, so, and then we have game engines, right? If you're using Unity or Unreal, you can uh, develop a game or develop an app and then use it on a PC, use it on a game console, or use it on the mobile, right? So that's another mechanism for you to develop something on the mobile phone. Just use one of the game engines. So Cordova and web-based, we discussed briefly. So let's let's talk a little bit about the um, let's talk a little bit about uh, sorry. Uh, where is this here? So Kotlin Java, uh, that's relatively straightforward. That's what you are the most familiar with. Um, so we have a programming language layer. Um, so let's this so here we have Android operating system uh, and the operating system kind of runs native code so native means it's already compiled for ARM platform right um, and then here we have uh, Kotlin 
or Java, which both run on Java Virtual Machine. And the Java Virtual Machine is using two techniques, which we discussed before, to get the native code running. Do you remember what they were called? JMI, Java Native Interface. Yeah, so Java Native Interface, we will talk a little bit about it in a moment. Was it just in time compiler? Yes, just in time compiler, and what was the other one? Uh, I should know this. <laughs> Ahead of time. Yeah. Right? So, just in time compiler kind of uh, compiles on the fly what it needs to execute into the native code. And ahead of, ahead of time compiler just compiles everything, and then you have everything as native code which runs directly on the, on the platform, right? So, you're developing your applications using those, one of those two languages, and that's sort of the technology stack that you use, right? Um, so, that's one, that's one thing. Flutter Dart, we're going to discuss it next week, so I will not uh, talk much about it. Um, so I, I just say um, Dart is the programming language developed at Google. It has a little bit of a dynamic feel, so it is. it was planned to be kind of a JavaScript replacement. So it's supposed to be a web front-end based programming language for web apps and for front-end heavy development. Uh, and Flutter is a cross-platform uh, framework or kind of a technology stack based on Dart to develop cross-platform um, applications. So then we have Xamarin. Um, Xamarin is similar to what we just uh, showed here. Um, so if we do that, it has pretty much the same on the bottom. So up to here, it's kind of yeah, the same. And then instead of JVM being Microsoft, what do you think they use? .NET. .NET, of course. So they use .NET. And then being .NET, what do they use for the language? Do they use Kotlin and Java, or what comes to mind? C-sharp. Sure. So they use C-sharp, right? Um, so now you develop your app using C-sharp. Then you have a .NET kind of virtual machine, which then does similar things to Java, compiles the stuff to the native um, execution, and then you run the, the code. Um, so you can uh, check the, um, the details of the um, Xamarin platform on a Microsoft um, page. Oops. So they say, you know, apps built using Xamarin look and feel native because they are native. Um, we will discuss what what native means today. Right, so that's the kind of the general theme for today's lecture. Uh, so keep that in mind. So you will see various uses of the word native. Um, so native user interface, native API access, native performance. They really, you know, stress <laughs> the word native uh, in everything they say, right? Um, and then the, the beauty is um, you have the shared C, C sharp logic. Uh, and then you can kind of reuse it on multiple platforms. So you can reuse it on iOS, uh, Android, and Windows Mobile, but you can also reuse it on Windows and Mac, right? So you can do both mobile developments and some of the reuse of the C-sharp code for your desktop developments. The difference is the UI, right? So the UI is different for various platforms and also for the desktop and so on, but the business logic expressed in C-sharp can be reused. Make sense? Um, you've heard about it before? Yeah. Yeah. So I also have a short, um, short video. Um, yeah, let's do this and 
Now I will do a short so the sound yeah the sound should work right uh, sound You create apps for all platforms with just one technology stack. C sharp language running on .NET framework. That's right. Xamarin apps. So right. Let's go back. You probably want to cover them both simultaneously, Oops. and maybe even Windows Droid. So you want to build an app? Well, there is always that question: iOS or Android? You probably want to cover them both simultaneously, and maybe even Windows devices for good measure. But creating so many different apps is expensive, time-consuming, and it takes a lot of engineering effort. Unless you're using Xamarin. Xamarin is a whole ecosystem of tools that helps you create apps for all platforms with just one technology stack. C-sharp language running on .NET framework. Xamarin apps, while created for different operating systems, share all business logic, database access, and network communication. Only user interfaces designed separately to maintain the native look and feel of each platform. Here's why you should consider Xamarin when building your app. First, c -sharp, .NET, and Visual Studio with installed Xamarin, these are the only three components required to create apps for all operating systems. There are emulators available for all mobile platforms, but if you're a Mac fan, feel free to create iPhone apps on your machine as well. You also have several options for debugging, whether from desktop, emulator, or directly on a device. Xamarin apps also boast an unmatched performance level compared to hybrid or other cross-platform development tools. For instance, image loading in native apps is only 14% faster than using Xamarin, and even a more significant difference in image... Si All right. So remember when they said everything is native? Like if Xamarin is native, why they compare it to native? All right, yeah, it's some, some broken logic now, right? So if <laughs> everything Xamarin does is native, then what is this? We come back to that. Speed is simply unrecognizable by a mere human. Let's also not forget that different operating systems have elements that drastically distinguish them from each other. And obviously, you want to fit in. For an Android user, it's natural to use the menu tabs on top of the screen while iOS users enjoy different patterns. Xamarin allows you to achieve this native look and feel by two methods. The easier, quicker, and more contained way is using Xamarin Forms. Xamarin Forms is a library of templates that helps you use standard interface elements and reach 100% of that longed-for, oft-promised code reuse. If you want more creative freedom, use Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android built-in tools for manual customization. And finally, Xamarin is open source, meaning free. It comes gratis with Microsoft's development environment, Visual Studio. This means if you've already bought and used that tool, you can start experimenting with Xamarin and its tools right away. Create Mac apps using Xamarin Mac, run automated testing with Xamarin Test Cloud, even make use of analytics using Xamarin Insights. But now, the rest of the Xamarin story, the downside. Are there pitfalls? Yes, let's talk about it. You already know that if you're building an app with heavy UI, you'll have to manually rewrite some parts of platform-specific code using the required language, Swift or Objective-C on iOS, and Kotlin or Java for Android. All right, so uh, short, short row. So I will keep this here. So we have um, C Sharp and .NET. we have the native kind of aspects and they also mentioned a few times uh, native uh, look and feel so I, I just say native ui right so that's another term which is often used um so native in general like we don't know exactly what exactly they mean and native ui okay um so now we have um the, the pitfalls, and the first pitfall is that if we, like what they say is if you have a heavy uh, UI-based application, you have to use native UI, not the one which Xamarin comes with, right? Yeah. 
Of course, Xamarin will update your business logic and Xamarin Forms elements automatically, but there's always a delayed reaction to a new platform version. Imagine, if a new version of Android dropped today, you'd have to wait a few days before the Xamarin team updates the tools so you can update your app. Finally, the population of Xamarin professionals in the labor pool is still quite low. About 10% of all members of the mobile development community are Xamarin developers. You'll find way more developers working exclusively with iOS or Android than people versed in Xamarin. But don't give up. The Xamarin community is growing strong. With the abundance of tutorials and the official online Xamarin University, any c .NET engineer can acquire the needed skills to build cross-platform apps. Considering all that, let's quickly recap under what circumstances you should consider Xamarin. To be honest, building games, complex animations, or custom user experience is pointless with Xamarin. Yes, you get the code reuse, but you still have to spend a lot of time wiring UI to each platform. OK, so it's kind of uh, interesting here on two, two levels. So on one level, what he's talking about is all the pitfalls of what you not should use Xamarin for, whereas the slide and the animation is about what you should use it for, right? So <laughs> like doing games with Xamarin says, no, you should not do that. And complex UIs, not you should not do that and so on, right? So complex apps, complex UIs, complex logic, no. And the text says for simple, apps with simple UI, yes, right? Uh, so it's a little bit like uh, confusing. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, for simple UI, simple UI elements and simple apps, Xamarin is fine, perfect. For anything complex, it's not, right? So you lose the main benefit Xamarin provides, the right once run anywhere approach. If you've got tight deadlines, you can skip a lot of development stages with Xamarin. Without heavy UI customization, you can quickly write one code, share it across platforms, and have a whole lineup of apps ready for download in less than six months. Not many small and mid-sized businesses have separate development teams for both iOS and Android. With Xamarin, you can enter the market on low budget with a small team of in-house or outsourced engineers for support. Xamarin is one of the tools that make app development more accessible to businesses. Of course, there's still a gap when we're talking about graphics-packed apps, but Xamarin takes mobile first out of the concept arena and into reality for many companies. All right. Great. Oh, uh, don't go to sleep. All right, so um, what we got is first we got the claims that Xamarin is native, and then we have a comparison to the native, right? So what was the um, what was the the first pitfall between Xamarin and native? You remember? Speed. No. It was speed, but speed of what? The, the speed was the second pitfall. The first one was that not everything that is available on the native platform is available in Xamarin. So for some complex things, you have to dig deep and get the uh, Java or C sharp, uh, no, not C sharp, the Objective C code to exploit the native capabilities. Right. So uh, in native, you have everything available. Uh, Everything which the platform offers is available to the developers. Um, in, in Xamarin, that not knows the case. Not everything is available. You, for some features, you have to go to the native layer and get it done this way using Java or Kotlin or Objective C or Swift. Right. The second one was that for what's available on the platform, uh, it takes time to be available on the Xamarin. Right. So Xamarin will update what is. Uh, available in Xamarin, but it takes time. So uh, the uh, time for features, right? So the, the features available in, in Xamarin, they show up, but like if something is available on Android, in Xamarin it will be available after some time. Um, so during that time, you have to use the native 
features anyway, right? So for native, there is no delay. Like what's available is available. Like if Google announces something, it's there. If Apple gives something to iOS, it's there. And developers can use it straight away. In fact, Apple and Google offer it to developers before it's available on the general public. So the developers can develop app with new features which are not yet available on the platform. And then once they are available, you have already a ready app. Right, so time to market is kind of uh, enhanced with the native uh, supported platforms. So those were the, the main features for native. Um, you have some benefits of, of using um, of using Xamarin, and I'm using Xamarin as an example because you have other cross-platform frameworks which are similar, uh, which are trying to achieve similar things. Right, they kind of translate what native capabilities are into some common layer. And this common layer is both for iOS and Android. But they all have those same strengths and the same pitfalls. Right? So the biggest advantage of, of Xamarin is that if you have already a C-sharp team, and if you have C-sharp expertise, you can use it. Right? Uh, you don't have to relearn Java and Kotlin. You can use your existing team to do mobile development. So for teams which are .NET and C-sharp based, that's the answer. That's the solution which Microsoft gives them to uh, to develop applications for their mobile platforms, right? Um, and that's the bottom line. The bottom line is not anything else but this, right? If you have the capabilities and if you have capacities in developing C# -sharp applications, then you can take advantage of it by using Xamarin uh, and doing the cross-platform uh, development. All right. So then, whoops. Um, where is the mouse? So this is a, an example screenshot uh, I took from uh, from the web, which shows um, a Xamarin app being deployed on um, iOS, on Android, and on uh, Windows Phone, right? Uh, and you can see it looks good. Uh, it looks native. Right, so the, the, the native UI. So what, what is native UI? Well, native UI is that on iOS you have menus usually at the bottom, and Android you usually have this um, you know sandwich icon or menus which kind of are slide down. And the same app looks kind of good because you don't have the mix up, right? Uh, and then I don't know how like you, you have. I, I never used. Windows Mobile, but apparently you have some sort of a menu system with, with, with that button, right? So it kind of uh, showcases that um, we have two two aspects to the native UI. Uh, it looks native, right, and is native. Um, so from the user's point of view, it doesn't matter. Like the, I, I cannot tell if it is really using native components or it just looks native, right? And for the user, it doesn't matter, right? For developers, it depends. It may matter, right? Uh, how you are achieving certain things, um, and also if it is native, what it means is every time the platform updates and changes, like a slider or something, it will be updated, right? If it only looks native. Every time the platform changes, delay, right? It will not look native for some time, and then it will look native again, right? Um, so the distinction between looking native and being native is kind of important um, in the long term of um, uh, support for the for the platform. All right. So now we're going back to this uh, C++ thing for a brief moment. Um, why would you do an Android or iOS development in C++? What are the reasons? Yeah? Faster sometimes, because it runs on the native. You mean performance-wise? Yeah, performance. Performance, yeah? Because you can, you don't have to run the code on the JVM, for example. Yeah, so yeah. You're, you're basically saying that if we're using C++, we're compiling it directly to this native layer, and we don't have all those overheads related yeah. to that, right? And by native, I mean that, you know, the machine code. Yeah. yeah. It's one to one with the actual instructions for the CPU. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, if you need to do more low level stuff with it direct, directly with the hardware, maybe. That's right. What else? So for low level programming, interacting directly with the OS services, with the hardware, with the drivers, uh, for the performance, what else? Yeah. Games maybe. Well, yeah, practice. you've already developed an uh, OpenGL game. You took the OpenGL course. Uh, you have your codes, code in C, C++ with OpenGL. And then you say, I'm not going to rewrite it in Java. Like I, It's already working. I have those demos in C++ and OpenGL. Like, why would I need to rewrite it? I, I like to recompile it for the native platform and use the capabilities of the phone to, to use it, right? So existing code. Uh, or existing libraries. You may just have a library already developed uh, for machine learning or for your graphics or for whatever, right? Um, yeah, those are those are good points. Um, so let's see how many I came up with. So existing code base and existing libraries. That's the main reason why we have C++ code on Android or iOS. Games, OpenGL, Drivers, low-level processing, networking, OS support, yeah. C++ is cross-platform, right? You can cross-compile it for iOS, for Android, and for mobile, uh, Windows Mobile or for desktop, right? You, if you have your graphics course code and it runs on your PC, you can kind of make it run on the uh, Android or iOS as well. And then you just maintain a single code base, right? So Cross-platform is same as it was highlighted with Xamarin. It is also a feature of why you might use C++. Um, and performance. That's true. But it's not as easy as it sounds, right? If you have, let's say, um, some image processing library done in C++, and it uses some matrix manipulations for filtering applying some filters on your image, and you have it done in Java, which one do you think will run faster? They will kind of run similar, and if your UI is in Java and you have to communicate to C++, the C++ will run slower, because you have to pass data back and forth, right? So if your UI and everything is written in Java, and you're only doing some processing in C++, Actually, you will not gain that much. Uh, if you're doing some low-level networking, if you're doing some sort of driver-level processing directly on memory, sure, then you will gain the benefits of C++. But if you're doing something on the kind of application layer, more often than not, C++ is not really giving you much. Um, and in particular, there is a library for vision, for image processing, and, and so on, called uh, OpenCV. And it has uh, uh, Java bindings. And if you're using this library, use Java bindings. It, it's as fast as if you were using C++. In fact, most of the time, because you don't know how to optimize the conversions between Java and C++, your code, if you're using the C++ version, will be slower than the one using Java. Right? Um, so that's. Um, that those are the main reasons why we go with C++. Um, one extra comment before the break. So when they were highlighting Xamarin and saying native, native, they compare it to native and they show that it's slower than native, right? So why, like, what does it mean? Like, where, where are we losing performance? Uh, if everything is compiled to native code, why doing this? This path is slower than doing something else. Where, where is the problem here? Yeah? Because they'll have a wrap on top of the native libraries to make it cross-platform across iOS and Android. Exactly. So the thing is, there is kind of a, there has to be a thick kind of a service layer uh, of services and everything which are kind of supported by the platform. And this layer, if you're doing this pathway, uh, is kind of natively supported by the platform itself. So they, they kind of do all the bindings and all the things kind of really efficiently here. Uh, whereas with the .NET, here you have the, a, a bit of a, a performance penalty, right? 
So here you're losing some some performance because you have to bind it and you have to convert types and you have to do some things which convert certain things to certain other things, right? So even though in theory you have kind of a cross compilation going all the way to the native and you can use the, the native code, yeah, it works for some things but not for all things and then you have this intermediate layer which is more streamlined with this than with this. And it, it, th this picture is the same for iOS. iOS has the same, so if you're developing using uh, Xamarin or Objective-C, Objective-C has the same benefits as Java has here, right? Um, the other thing is, uh, normally in Java world, everything gets con converted to native, um, to native code, e eventually. So when you're executing any logic, you're always executing it natively with the uh, machine code, right? Um, for I'm not sure for Xamarin, but for some other um, uh, systems, like especially with the uh, game engines, some things you can compile down to native, but some things you can interpret, right? So you can have, especially for the web frameworks, if you have a JavaScript, you're not going to compile the JavaScript directly to the machine code. You're going to have an interpreter which interprets the JavaScript bytecode, right? Uh, so, and it's the same with .NET and with J JVM in theory. Uh, you basically have kind of a interpreter layer which can run C Sharp on top of .NET without really cross-compiling it. Uh, and what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is that it's a little bit faster to bootstrap because you start interpreting it straight away. Uh, and you can hot swap it. So you can kind of very dynamically change the logic of what you're interpreting because it's just an interpreted uh, pipeline, right? Uh, and then you're losing some performance here as well. So depending how much of the libraries and everything is actually cross-compiled to native and how much of it is kind of within the .NET bytecode uh, and then interpreted from the bytecode level, you may be losing some performance there. According to the numbers, it's not much. It's like a small percentage of the, uh, of, you know, tr truly native pipeline. But it's still uh, some performance loss. Um, so you can say the same between J JVM bytecode and uh, C++, which doesn't have the kind of a bytecode layer ever, right? But those two technologies kind of are so optimized and so advanced on Android that you will not really see much of a difference. Um, and because all the UI and everything kind of from the uh, user point of view is in this space, as I'm saying, you will be losing performance by translating types. If you have to communicate very quickly and a lot between your C++ library and your Java library, then that's the bottleneck, right? Um, all right, so let's have a 10 minutes break and then we will continue. Questions? Uh, so it's not about uh, this course right now, but yep. uh, uh, the GitLab that we're hosting here, mm -hmm. um, the CI and CD pipelines on there. Yeah. I don't know if Christopher mentioned you. No. Nope. Uh, we're tra trying to do that on the, on the graphics uh, course, mm -hmm. to, like validate code and compile it there. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's some like permissions issues with like installing libraries that are required when we're setting it up. Okay. So I'm not sure if that's possible to like. Yeah. yeah so can about. you? Um, can you open an issue yeah. and then put the error messages that you are getting into yeah. the issue and then put, uh, link me on the Discord yeah. with the issue tracker? Uh, on the graphics Discord? Um, issue tracker or which yeah, is that's a good question. Let me just check. Uh, I think we have, we have now one project which is um, 
let me see. I don't think it was in the teaching. GTL administration. Yeah, maybe in this one. Yeah, so uh, check if you have access to this one. Mm -hmm. It's called GTL-administration. Yeah. And if, it, if you have, then put the issue in, in this one. And you can assign me as well, yeah. so okay. I, I will get uh, yeah. the notification. And I'll send you the link but but well, ping so. me, uh, yeah, ping me with the link on Discord as well. Okay. And put the data that uh, you got, like the error message yeah. and, and things, yeah. yeah. So maybe there are some things I have to install, like as a um, sysadmin, mm -hmm. uh, and then it will be available. Yeah. Um, th there were... Um, people who are using the uh, continuous integration and they said for scripts that they have mm -hmm. and if they're doing something which the Linux like shell supports yeah. it works fine yeah. for some things where especially with the docker yeah. they had problems yeah. so I, I don't know exactly what is the nature of that like whether we are missing some docker services mm -hmm. or something but yeah if, yeah, if you do I that tried both, but no, no, none of them work but that's because like probably because it said like don't have permission to install libraries yeah so, uh, exactly yeah. so maybe it's just a permission issue yeah. and then i i just install the libraries and yeah, yeah. okay cool. yeah, sounds good thanks
All right, so let's let's continue. Um, so we listed the reasons why one might use C++ um, and if we... Um, where is the mouse? If we think of other languages like Rust, Haskell and so on, um, some of those overlap. So you already have some programs written in a particular language uh, you want to reuse it, you have a library written in a particular language, you want to reuse it on the mobile, uh, you only want to maintain one code base. Um, so those are the two main reasons. Uh, the familiarity with the team, so that's what we were discussing with Xamarin. If you have a team which is, for example, skilled in Rust, uh, then reuse it. Uh, reuse the skills, write the business logic for the applications in Rust, and then um, cross-compile it for a mobile platform uh, of choice. Uh, you may have, you have, you might have been using Rust for games or for some security-oriented applications, then you don't want to be rewriting it. Um, and we also discussed that sometimes you have to have, you, you have a particular domain focus. So for example, you're working with drivers or you're working with networking or you're working with encryption or working with something that you have a good support in a particular language, uh, then you want to reuse that from that language. Uh, so Java or C Sharp or whatever language for that particular platform is, may not have the capabilities to easily work with that particular domain, in which case you have to fall back to um, an existing um, um, language that you already have code base with. Um, so, how hard it is to program, let's say, with C++? Um, 
yeah let me see so it's not that hard um, but um, where is my mouse so if I close the So if you, if, if we've already seen it, so if you say I want to start a new project and if you pick uh, C++, um, what happens is you will get um, a skeleton for a project which is using uh, C++ and that's probably the best, the easiest way to start. Um, so if I say uh, native demo, you can use Kotlin as a, a basis and then C++ as a library, or you can use Java here, right? Uh, same as before. So that highlights uh, kind of a dual nature of, um, of this particular setup, right? So in Android Studio, if you say I will have some native capability, uh, you basically using one of the two modes. So there is, um, for Android, it's Java Kotlin plus C++ in a form of library, right? So you have some logic, which is expressed as native code, and but the rest of your app is in the Kotlin or Java, right? So that's uh, one typical mode of operation. Um, Similarly, on, on that's on Android. On iOS, you would have you know Swift, Swift or Objective C, and then you would have a library which is sort of native, right? So then, for cross-platform, this is your cross-platform part. The rest is specific for the for the app, you know platform that you're targeting. Um, so what are the okay? So the second model is. Um, the, it's a disadvantage to have to maintain th those two things for two platforms, right? So if you have a game and all your UI is uh, in OpenGL and so on, why do you even bother with Java and Kotlin or uh, Objective C? Why not have C++ only, right? Um, so that's the second mode. Uh, Android Studio doesn't support that mode of operating out of the box, you have to tweak it and you have to do a little bit of manual work to have this happen. Uh, and for this to happen, you're using uh, NDK. We'll talk a little bit about it in a moment. For this, you're using what has been mentioned before, which is Java Native Interface, right? J, I, J and I. Uh, Java Native Interface is the interface between um, the native library and native capability and Java world, right? So I will just quickly generate the, um, I will use Java. I will generate a new project. Uh, I will choose the default tool chain. You should choose the default one and it will fall to a particular C++ based on what tools you have. Um, and I have it here. So then, what you will see is that you have um, Oh, come on. So in your project, in your module, in your uh, app module, you have some Java source code and you have some C++ source code. Um, and you're maintaining kind of a uh, Java source code and C++ source code. In the typical situation, you already have C++ library, right? You will not be maintaining the C++ uh, code yourself. You might already have a library, right? So you're kind of uh, hooking it together. Um, but in this kind of a de um, generated scenario, you have um, C++ code which looks like this. And it is kind of an ugly looking function um, with string from JNI method um, and that basically returns a string. It's as simple as you can get in kind of a hello world example. 
um, but you see that it's not your typical um, it's not your typical C++ function or C function. It, it, it has some quirks, right? And the quirks are, you have to use this, um, you know, extern um, statement. Make it larger? Yep. Um, yep. So you have to have this, um, uh, external statement saying it's it's basically a C call C type of uh, function call which is uh, exported through the JNI interface um, and then it follows a particular naming convention of what the function has to be right um, and it starts with Java and then uses underscores instead of space or, dot or uh, dots and it's a full package name of the class that is using that function, right? So what happens here is we kind of declaring a logic uh, in C++ or C uh, that it's rooted in a particular class with a particular function name, right? Uh, and then from Java world, we can call it. Uh, it has a very um, specific way of passing the parameters because it is an instance method, it has to have uh, this reference, and because it is being called from Java, it has to have this uh, environment being passed around, and then it basically um, does something, right? So what, what normally happens is you have your normal C++ code, uh, which does some logic. So all your C++ code is kind of uh, hidden and does some logic, and then from Java, you may need to call some function, right? If you need to call a particular function, you have to do this. So you'll have a layer which interfaces between your normal C++ functions and naming conventions and what you have, and Java. And this layer looks kind of ugly like this. It follows a particular structure and it follows particular naming conventions, and that's what you do. Um, there are tools to generate those um, skeletons for you. So instead of you typing it yourself by hand, what you say is you say, I want to have a, a particular function from C being called in Java. And you write that as a normal function signature in C um, or in C++. And then you run a particular program which generates this code with an empty body. And then you just fill in the body for your, for your function. Right? Makes sense? Um, and then on the Java side, what you need is you need to declare that you will have, you see, I have a class called main activity, and I have a public function, public method, which returns a string, but it doesn't have any body. The body actually is in C, right? The body of this method, uh, I will make it bigger. So the method I have here is, um, so you have your main activity, and main activity has an extra method which is public and not static, which is an instance method. Um, but instead of body of this method, I just said native, <laughs> right? Which means the actual behavior of this method is written in C. Uh, and I can call this method. So like they calling it to set the text of the text view and they saying string from JNI, which is this, this function, this method. Um, and it will work fine. Um, the only thing that is needed is you have to have the library loaded, right? So before you can call this native method, you have to load the, the C++ or C library that you uh, loaded. I'm, I'm mixing C++ and C. JNI is only for C. You cannot really do C++, right? So if you have your C++ code base, this layer between your C++ world and Java will be C calls. Um, and there are some limitations. So limitations are what can you pass back and forth, what type can you use, and so on. So even with string, it's already a little bit of a hassle, right? Because I cannot just pass strings around because Java and C++ represent strings differently and encode them differently and so on and so forth. So if I have a C string, uh, I cannot just say return hello from C++, right? What I had to do is I have to say, 
Well, I have to take this string and convert it to something that Java will understand that that's a string. And that's why I'm, I'm using this environment to call a method which says, create me a new string, a, a new UTF string, which Java will understand from this C string, right? So you already see that even for passing a string, um, I, I'm already calling two extra functions. I'm calling the normal C++ uh, string to a C pointer, right? To C string. So you, you know, C++ and C also represent strings differently. Uh, and C is a char array with the slash zero kind of at the end. And C++ has a more elaborate structures for the strings. Uh, but you can get a C string from C++ calling, you know, this. Um, so, so hello is a C++ string. And hello.c string returns me the C version of that string. And that, that C version of that string is passed to this method to generate something that Java will understand, right? Uh, so it's already quite complex, right? For just the simplest thing you, you're doing here. Um, so it's a little bit easier to mix C because if I if I said it's a, a car pointer that hello is a car, car pointer, right? Uh, then I can pass it directly here. Um, but because it's a C++ string that I have to do a little bit of a tricks. Um, so it is possible to mix some of the C++ and uh, C data structures, but you have to do some of the translating yourself. Um, and then in here, I like, because this project is already pre-generated, it has all the necessary um, hooks already done. Uh, I know that this native lib C++ will be compiled into the library called native lib, and then it will be loaded with this call, and then I can just call this function. Um, yeah, is that is it simple? Well, it's not that simple, but it's not that hard. Uh, if you have to do those steps manually, it's a little bit more work, and you have to use kind of a command line tools to to achieve that. Um, as I was saying, you don't typically write those um, signatures yourself by hand. You just write this. You just say, I need uh, a placeholder for this method now, right? And you run a tool, and the tool will generate that, that uh, file for you with empty body, and then you fill in the logic for the body, right? So what will happen is I would write this by hand, I would write this line uh, and then run the tool which generates the C++ equivalent. So the tool will generate this without the body. And then I just fill in the body of what this method actually is doing on, in C++, C or C++ side of things. All right. Um, so with Rust, with Haskell and so on, it gets dependent on the language. It gets kind of similar or more complicated. On every language, you have to have a layer of translating between the types and the representations of the types there and the types and the representations in Java, right? Uh, string is not that straightforward. Um, integers, floats uh, are fine, like representing integers, floats, doubles, those primitive data types between different languages is almost always the same. So passing int between C++ and or C and Java, no problem. Uh, arrays, no problem. Uh, if you have vector, like in C++, so yeah, it's problematic. Java doesn't understand C++ vectors. You have to convert it. Usually, you have to convert it to an array or something like this. So with very primitive types, no problems. Um, but so uh, primitive types, fine. Anything else? Not really. Um, so I'm not sure we will have time, but I uh, tested yesterday with uh, Go, what Go supports, and primitive types like strings and um, numbers and so on. It's okay-ish. Uh, if you have a struct and you want to create a struct and share it with Java from Go, it's already not working, right? So it's kind of problematic even for like simple things. You're already hitting kind of a uh, difficulties of what you want to do, right? So typically what happens is you will want to trigger things and do everything in the native library 
and very communicate as little as possible to this layer, right? Um, if you can, you should do this. So the advantage of this is that uh, everything you're doing is within the same language, within the same uh, programming technology stack, and you don't pay the performance penalty, and you don't have the complexity on converting from this world to one of those, right? What's the disadvantage of this? Yeah? You don't get access to any of the higher level functionality. Exactly. That makes everything easier. Exactly. So for here, if you want a button, you have to do your own button in OpenGL, right? You, you cannot say, oh, I just want these Java buttons that I normally have here, right? If you want kind of a action bar, no, <laughs> you have to do everything yourself, right? You don't have access to all the functionality which you normally take for granted for the UI. But if you have a game and you're doing OpenGL and you have all your interface anyway, uh, user interface done yourself, then you don't care. You don't want the high level things, right? Um, for some things, um, for example, accessing accelerometer, accessing camera, and so on, uh, Google really put effort into support libraries for C++, so you have access to those things, right? Uh, so you can access uh, contact book and some things kind of natively from C++. Uh, you don't need Java for that, right? So for some of the platform level services that you normally access from Java, you can access them from C++ as well. Uh, not everything, and definitely nothing in the UI, right? Um, so notifications and things like that. Um, I'm not sure if you can do not notifications natively with, with C++. All right, uh, this keyboard. So then we have this HTML, CSS stack. What do you think this one is used for? Well, and what are the benefits? Yep. Uh, Cross-platform development again, but also for web apps as well. Yep. So existing web apps can be easily ported to be run on mobile. Uh, and you have a cross-browser and cross-platform uh, capabilities, right? So you can develop a logic, and then people can access this logic from anywhere. Um, there is a huge appeal of web technologies because they are the most accessible, the, the easiest to get access to, right? So imagine that you're developing a game. You develop the game in C++, some simple game, uh, Flappy Bird. Uh, and you, you've used uh, OpenGL, right? Um, so now you can compile it for Windows, and people on Windows can play it. You can say, no, nah, great. Uh, so people on Windows can play it. Uh, but you know, Mac people cannot play it. So they say, yeah, you have to compile it for Mac, right? So then the developer releases the Mac version, and Android version, and iOS version. And some, somebody cannot access it, right? Uh, they have some weird operating system. They have browser and so on, but they cannot get it running, right? Uh, so this is kind of a uh, cumbersome, right? So now let's take a web. So someone has a browser, and you have the the browser technology stack. You have the uh, WebGL, WebGL. You have WebAssembly, right? So with WebGL and WebAssembly, this developer can compile it into a kind of a web app, which is accessible from a browser. And now anybody with a browser can play the game, right? So the web is the most accessible platform, and that's why we're kind of putting a lot of effort into making web technologies uh, possible. Um, so if somebody already has this HTML, uh, CSS, uh, JavaScript sort of uh, logic, and they are using the web technology, then this solution is for them. They can uh, benefit from mobile platforms supporting all of that um, and reach the, the, the audience. Um, so we briefly mentioned Cordova and kind of a web app access by the browser. Uh, so what's the difference? What's the difference between something that is packaged 
into a, a standalone app and distribute it and something that is accessed within the browser. When would you use what? Yep. Native one would probably be better for performance requiring applications. No, sorry, the native one. So, you, yeah, you're using the word native. So, we, we have uh, Cordova, which is like packaged up HTML and CSS and distributed for the platform. Or you have same logic, but accessed from the web in the browser. So when would you package it up, and when would you let it being used from the, yeah? So Cordova is something you would potentially download and then have installed on your phone? That's right, yeah, that's right. So in Cordova, you're downloading it and installing on the phone. And then you open it up, and it kind of looks like an app, but it's really a web view which shows you the web page. And then you interact with it. Yeah? Well, I guess if you want to call it in the app store. Yeah, like exactly. Like so if you want to publish in the App Store, you have to package it up. If the user doesn't have network access while they're using the app, you have to package it up because they cannot access otherwise the, the service, right? Um, so there are benefits of packaging it up in terms of offline access and in terms of publishing in the App Store. What is the disadvantage? What's the advantage of keeping it on, on the website? You know, like accessibility and uh, frequent CF updates. Exactly. If, if you have new version every day, if you keep working on it and there is improvements happening all the time, that's better just to keep it as a web app because then users accessing it will always get the latest version. There is no update needed. Whereas with the app, they have to update it, right? And you also have users who have the old version, users who have the newer version, and users who have the newest version, right? You have to maintain access to services and things like whatever the app is doing um, and you have no control when people will update you can ask them please update but it's up to the user to update right some users are updating some users are not updating um, so you you have to decide so that's between cordova versus web app if we put versus native then what's the advantage of of native why google has gmail as a native app and as a web app, you can, if you have Android phone or iOS phone, you can access your Gmail, you can install a Gmail app, or you can access Gmail through a browser, right? So what's the, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Feels snappier and more like the other apps on your phone, so it's more integrated into the phone. Exactly, yeah. So people tend to like it. Like even though I can read my Gmail emails through a browser, mobile interface on in, in a mobile browser, I tend to install Gmail app and use Gmail from the Gmail app uh, because it is snappier. It has more features. It is more integrated with notifications and so on. Right? For example, with the browser, if I don't open the browser, I don't get any notifications about my Gmail emails coming in. But if I have an app, it's integrated with the OS. And it tells me, oh yeah, you have new email, right? Um, so you can kind of uh, um, think what it is that the user will benefit from one deployment side or another. All right, and we have something from um, from which company? Which company is behind React Native? React is a like, use for web deployment. Yeah, it's a React is a web framework for developing cross-platform web applications, and then React Native is a add-on to React framework for doing um, mobile web apps. Right. Facebook is behind That's React. Um, so Facebook came with this idea that um, people didn't like web apps on the mobile because the UI is unified, right? If I have, um, 
if I have a web page um, and I do something like I, I design it um, and I open it in the browser and it looks good and I open it in my mobile phone it kind of scales and it kind of looks good but it kind of looks like the uh, same as the web app on my desktop it doesn't look Android or iOS -y for the feel, right? Um, so they say people don't like those because they kind of look like web apps, not like a native apps. So how about we do everything behind the scene the same way we're doing it, but just for the UI, we will kind of uh, pretend it looks like native. It will kind of have uh, a native feel for um, Android, and it will have those kind of uh, things. Um, uh, arrow on iOS and it will kind of look pretend on for the user that the user cannot distinguish whether it's a native app or not uh, and that's what react native is it uses HTML CSS and JavaScript for developing the logic of the app and for developing the uh, look and feel but then you can access some of the native looking components on a particular platform uh, from within the framework itself and they can use native actual native um, UI elements or they can kind of fake some of the UI elements to look kind of native right um, I have a, uh, a screenshot for uh, some of the look and feel uh, and does it feel kind of a web appy or does it feel kind of okay it feels kind of okay. There is one one big problem with this. So what's the big problem here? Is it an iOS or Android looking app? Can you tell the difference? Yeah. Kind of Android. It's kind of Android looking app, right? But this is a an iOS device, right? So it's an iOS device with the Android looking up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so whoever was generating the screenshots kind of messed it up, right? Um, because they should have used an Android device for the Android looking up. Um, but it looks OK. Uh, so and behind the scene, you have all the web tech, right? You have uh, CSS and so on. And you have React, which is like a web framework for developing an app. So you can develop an app and then deploy it for the browser or deploy it for the for the mobile, right? Um, again, who should use it? You should you use it? Well, you could use it if, if the app is very simple and you want to cover both desktops and mobile uh, users, right? Uh, if the UI is complicated, if the app is actually using some of the sensors or uh, native capabilities of the device, you probably should stick to, to native. All right, so again, uh, React Native, what do they mean by native? Well, they kind of mean native looking UI, right? They don't mean there is anything native in terms of actually access to the platform, code, and so on. It's just that the interface looks kind of uh, typical to the user, to the platform the user is used to, right? So the, the word native, again, is a bit of a marketing term for highlighting that the UI is as close or using the native components as possible, right? Um, so we get to the to the end of the class, and after you know close to two hours talking about native, what is native? How would you define native app? So if I ask you, okay, so you know, bottom line, what is a native app and what is a native app? Is Xamarin app a native app or not? Who would say, yeah, it is? How would you define a native app? What would be like 100% clearly defined native app? Is one using a React Native a native app? I would kind of, I'm not, I would kind of think like, as long as it uses look and feel, in a way. So if it has the same user interface elements, yeah. it would be mostly 
um, a major event. It doesn't really, if it, it's not every, it doesn't have to run every single thing on the lowest machine level instruction. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm, I'm doing more like an assembly definition. I'm thinking more like a native hair is more like a look and feel. Yeah. So you could you could base your definition on the look and feel and kind of um, say things that kind of look native are native. But that would be uh, pushing the definition a little bit, right? Um, so let's let's try to have a taxonomy, right? So let's say I have a C++ app that runs runs on uh, iOS and Android. That's one. Then I have um, Java Kotlin, Kotlin app uh, and Swift, Swift uh, Objective-C app. Um, then I have um, Xamarin, and then I have uh, React Native, Native, and then I have a kind of a Cordova, Cordova-based standalone app, which I can publish in the App Store and and so on, right? Uh, Cordova can be used together with React Native um, to package up a kind of a React Native, and they actually do that. They they use, uh, but you can use a different framework. So for Cordova, you could use, for example, Angular, right? Um, you could use Angular, JS, or something else for the, for your app. You're using web technologies here. So if I have kind of like the different text stacks, uh, what would you like? What would you say? It's like, yeah, that's native. That's not native. It's up to you. Like, there is no really wrong answer, right? So, would React Native be called be considered a native app? Would you consider it a native app? Would you consider a native app which is in the App Store but is using HTML and CSS and JavaScript? Well, if it doesn't use the same look and feel, then I wouldn't consider it. But yeah. If, but, uh, so if it uses kind of a, a native look and feel that you would, would really consider hard, it? As a user, at least, it would be very hard to tell the difference. Yeah. Unless it was fine. So I, I don't know, right? Uh, the answer to that is hard. And uh, it's, it's kind of um, really difficult. <laughs> uh, typically, uh, People who program in this technology stack are called developers for native apps. So people who are using Java Kotlin or Swift Objective-C directly on iOS or Android, they are called native developers, right? But then that kind of <laughs> puts a big question mark, then the hell what this is, right? This is as native as you can get, right? Uh, in the Android Studio, it says public native method, right? <laughs> so the word native is in the source code. It says this call is native call, right? Um, so I don't know. <laughs> it's a little bit. Um, it's a little bit difficult. So I don't care really, right? I, I don't think it's that important. What I think is important is to be uh, clear of what you're saying, right? So for this, um, there is a, like a blog post. It says pros and cons of React Native. Uh, and React Native is using JavaScript, right? Um, and they say, I will make it bigger. Um, uh, so they want to go multi-platform. So they want to do cross-platform development, right? Um, and they were not thrilled with the web app because um, well, things have to be loaded from the actual. Um, so what they mean here is a is a kind of an icon to a web page, right? So by web app they mean an icon to a web page which is on your desktop, on the, on your phone, but you, it basically loads the the browser, right? Um, so um, 
and they say, since we wanted a native application, they considered Xamarin on React Native, right? So Xamarin and React Native are considered because they wanted a native app. This is a native app, right? Uh, but this is not cross-platform, right? So that's a wrong motivation. Like the motivation why you're using, why you want the, one of those two is because you want cross-platform, not because you want native. If you want native, you go here, right? Or here maybe, but not here. Th this is to me not really native. Uh, this is cross-platform, sure, but not native, right? Um, so, but, well, they, they kind of use the term differently than I would use it, right? Uh, I wouldn't use Xamarin and React Native as examples of native development because I really want a native app, right? Uh, I may want native app for those reasons. I may want native app because I want access to platform-specific things or I want the, the latest features. That's why I want a native app. What they want is they want cross-platform and they want the benefits of being cross-platform, not of being native, right? Um, so be kind of careful, like when, when, um, when we use the, the words, you have to be uh, careful of what is the purpose and why we're using it. Um, so Android NDK is called Native Development Kit. The word native is in the name of NDK. Uh, and it allows you to link your Java code to a native code, which is in C or C++. Uh, and the method signature has a word native when you're using the native method, right? So that's what this is, this, this question mark. So from one perspective, native really is this, right? Um, and that's, again, I would say native being used in this context or native being used in this context are the most common uses of the, of the term native. The, those are closed platform, but typically not native, right? Uh, so when you're using the, the word native in contexts like this, you probably should be careful. If you're using it in one of this or this context, you probably be understood, right? Uh, and probably nobody will raise uh, much of a you know, uh, problem. Um, so yeah, Android NDK is like a tool chain. It's like a set of tools to help you generate and run code which is written in C from within Java or just using uh, C, C++ directly on Android. So Android NDK is like the uh, tool stack for that. So that's it for today. We ran out of time. I had a small demo for doing Go. How many of you program in Go? Uh, some of you did the cloud course, uh, so I thought maybe you want to see how, how easy it is to, to do uh, some development or link your Android code to Go code. It is pretty straightforward for simple things. Um, it's simpler than in C++ actually. Um, but yeah, we ran out of time, so maybe I will uh, record like a short um, demo and link to the lecture. Do you have any questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Mm-hmm.